Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Um, would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this day and for all that it brings to us. We pray that you will bless us with a strong sense of your presence so that all that we do this morning, all we think and hear, all that we speak and sing, might bring glory only to you. And so we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand and make one another feel welcome at this house of the Lord?
Worship. Welcome to this place of worship. Welcome to this place of comfort. Welcome to this place of hope. Please be seated and join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, on this day when we remember and honor our mothers and all the women who have helped us throughout our lives, we ask for your blessing on all women everywhere who take on the task of nurturing others. We especially give you thanks for those women who step into difficult situations where mothering is desperately needed for foster mothers, 
adoptive mothers, nurturing friends, and caring advocates. May all who are hurting this day find and embrace the love that you offer to us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we have a special piece that combines the Asbury Bell Ringers, our junior high group, with the Wesley Bell Ringers, our older youth.
Join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And this is from the Common English Bible. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I am going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you have also known the Fa you also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, you don't, you know, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you all this time? Whoever, is, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it.
Please be seated. And our second scripture reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Your identity as believers, therefore, you identify as believers, therefore get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander, and stand like a newborn, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by, it, nourished by it, you will grow into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus is, it, thus is it written in scripture, look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though, the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because they refuse to believe in the word, they stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that they may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of the darkness into this amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you pray with me and for me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. What gives us our identity? You know, what, what is it that makes us who we are, that shape our lives? What factors do that for us? You know, identity takes shape, starts taking shape, at least from the moment of our birth. We are immediately the child of this particular woman and that particular man. And we become part of the matrix of family relationships. And needless to say, the government gets involved as soon as we are born also. Um, and we have our birth certificates. And this poor guy, I don't know how his birth certificate ended up on the internet, but I found it. And so there it is from the state of New York. But the reason I used it, because it was very official, state of New York, Department of Health, Division of Vital Statistics. So from the moment we are born, we are a vital statistic. And it's only the first of many forms of identification. Um, you used to have to wait, or most people did wait, until they were about the age that they were starting to apply for jobs to get your social security number. Now um, the children get it very young, and so we have our social security card, and that too will stick with us for our lives. Going to school, at some level, you start getting ID cards, student identification cards. I think I got my first one in junior high, but it was junior high, high school, um, college, identifying us as students and as learners. And somewhere in um, later adolescence is that great rite of passage where we get our driver license. <clears throat> It's hard to believe that Cartman's old enough to drive, isn't it? Yeah. You have to watch South Park to understand. But um, driver's license, it is a part of, becomes a part of our identity because it represents both taking on adult freedoms, and, but also the adult responsibilities that go with it. Throughout our lives, we'll probably have various work ID cards. Um, used to be that you could have one for one company 
all of your career. That is pretty rare these days, and so most of our younger folks will have multiple ID cards throughout their working lives. For some of you, a military service has been a part of your background, and so the military ID or the veterans, um, the VA, Veterans Administration ID cards are very important. And certainly that service shapes your identity. It shapes and forms it, sometimes fractures it and rebuilds it. Um, the, the experiences in military and as a veteran definitely have an impact on our identity. And then we are who we are biologically, and we know so much more about that now than we used to. It's not just our individualized fingerprints, but our DNA, all of the genetics involved. Probably the most impact on us um, is the family that we grow up in. Um, whether we are a mother, a child, a father, a grand parent or a grandchild, a step parent or stepchild, an uncle, an aunt, a nephew, a niece, a cousin, a friend, it all, the closest people that we spend the most time with have an enormous amount of impact on who we become and how we see ourselves. And sometimes it's when we are misunderstood that we learn things about ourselves. And this little cartoon has the ladybug going for therapy and saying, everyone keeps calling me a lady, but I'm really a tomboy bug. <laughs> But sometimes when we're misunderstood, we're actually shaped and formed by others' opinions, whether it's what we get teased for or bullied for, whether it's what we are complimented for and encouraged in, it's an impact. And then here in our particular American culture, we are way too often what we own. We are what we own. It is a peculiarly American curse to find our identity in inanimate objects. But if you think that having your house or your car or your toys or your clothes doesn't define you, talk to someone who has very little and ask them how their lack of house or car or toys or clothes affects their identity and how people relate to them. And you'll have some insight into how much what we take for granted identifies us. There are so many angles and influences that shape who we are. And then we have today's scripture from 1 Peter. I have to say there's a portion of it that is a snippet of my very favorite scripture. It says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. Once you were no people, now you are God's people. Or to paraphrase it, once you were nobody, now you are claimed by God. And for those of us who are thinking Christians, we hear these words about chosen race and red flags start going up um, because we don't like to think of it in terms of us being set apart as better than or above others. And we know that it has been used and misused throughout history. You know, the Jewish people from the Old Testament claim the, the the identity as chosen race, and it has served them well in, in their pride, in their faith, but it has also been used to oppress and to harm other people. White supremacists love this verse because they know who the chosen race is as far as they're concerned. So I'm asking you to set those kinds of things aside. Set those aside for a while and think about people who have been downtrodden or abused or put down or isolated or lonely and alone, those who have felt disconnected, disoriented, and unwanted. Now imagine them hearing, once you were no people, now you are God's people. 
Once you were nobody, now you are officially a somebody to God. Once you felt alone, now you belong to God. And you move from being disconnected to being a beloved son or daughter, just like that. A friend of mine was adopted as a baby. She was never quite sure of the circumstances of um, how she got put up for adoption, but she grew up knowing that she was a much-loved daughter. Her parents were very open with her about her adoption, and her identity, she says, included both the idea that she was her parents, her adoptive parents' much-loved daughter, but she also had a piece in there that knew, you know, she was a much-loved adoptive daughter. So both things together. And into adulthood, and as her mother aged and then passed away, um, she had forgotten more or didn't think about being adopted as much. And after her mother passed, um, she found that there was this hole in her life, as many of us do. Um, at age 55, my friend received an email out of the blue from a woman who said, I think I'm your sister. I think I'm your sister. And it, she was brave enough to get on a plane. She flew to Indiana to meet her half-sister, and she walked into a room and found it full of people, packed with people. And she felt an immediate sense of once again belonging. She said, um, half-jokingly afterwards, she said, these people looked like me. <laughs> they had the same fa the facial expressions and some of the same mannerisms and that some of their voices sounded like mine. And she said, I didn't realize how isolated and alone I felt after my mom's death until I realized that I had this huge, unexpected, extended family. And I finally found it once again. I found and felt what it feels like to belong, to matter, to have a place at the table and a position in a family. Once you were no people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received the mercy of knowing that you belong, and now you know. Mother's Day is so much about family and belonging and being grateful for belonging. But I believe there's an even deeper level of belonging that we can experience, like deeper than friendship, deeper even than family relationships. And that's the spiritual sense of belonging. When we come to realize that the most powerful force in the universe is reaching out to us, is reaching out to us, is naming us, calling us God's people, that God is claiming us, I have called you by name and you are mine. That God is loving us and blessing us and including us and saving us. Once you were nobody and now you are my somebody. Christians believe that being in a relationship with God is one of the most important things that we can do to be in touch with the divine, with that sacred power. United Methodists specifically believe that God is already reaching out to us, is claiming our lives, even before we're aware that there even is a God, and certainly before we realize that we need God. God's already reaching. It's sort of like a mother who cares for us even when we don't appreciate it and guides us even when we think we can do everything on our own. Bishop Elaine Stanofsky, our for, re, former bishop, had a saying that always made me smile. She said this, this is the good news. God loves you, and I love you, and there is nothing you can do about it. <laughs> nothing you can do about it. What a wonderful message for every day and on Mother's Day. 
whether your mom was the best mom ever or whether she was less than best or even hurtful. Today's good news is for all of us. You might think that you are alone in the world, but you are not. You are not. God's got your back, and child of God is your ultimate identity, no matter what other forces are at work in your life. You may have felt adrift or alone, but now you have found home. Home. Once we were no people, and now we are God's people. God loves you, and I love you, and the people around you this morning love you. God loves each one of us, claims us, and names us, and there is nothing we can do about it except love God back and love the people around us. Once we were no people, now we know we're God's people. Now we know who we are and to whom we belong. And it is an amazing thing. Amen. So I invite the Wesley Bell Ringers to come and get their stuff all set up. And if there was ever a way to say thank you to you for all the support that you give um, to our church, I think seeing all of our young people from the very smallest up to our college age kids, I hope that this morning that has made you feel that it is well worth supporting the ministries of Christ United Methodist Church.
Please join me in the dedication prayer. Gracious, generous God, we offer you these gifts and ask that you bless them and multiply them and use them to build your kingdom of love here on earth. We offer you our lives, our relationships, our hopes and our dreams, and our challenges, and ask that you bless us and strengthen us and use us to build your kingdom of love here on earth. May this day and every day be filled with your spirit, empowering us to be compassionate with all people in your name. Amen. And now join me in the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ make us gracious to others. And may the fellowship and strength of the Holy Spirit fill and empower us. Amen.